in the productive landscape of the limestone coast in the southeast corner of South Australia. The concept arose from a limestone coast development forum in 2012 and in 2014 through funding from PERS's premium food and wine innovation cluster, the group was formed um, whose focus was to work in a number of areas to develop a deeper understanding of the region's red meat industry, um, build innovation, grow profitability um, and enhance skills. The overreaching aim of the red meat cluster um, is to increase the size and value of the red meat industry in the limestone coast. Um, to do this, the red meat cluster brings together the entire red meat value chain and uh, delivers collaborative projects that target barriers to profitability. Uh, by promoting collaborative solutions to common problems, the red meat cluster aims to improve business profitability, um, which leads to more efficient, sustainable and ultimately more productive, valuable regional industry. The Limestone Coast Red Meat Cluster um, is overseen by an industry-wide strategy group with representatives from across the industry, including producers, transport, banking, local council, uh, processing, retail, research and extension. Tonight's topic, uh, which focuses on the lamb rib fracture project, is a great example of how the Limestone Coast Red Meat Cluster is collaborating with a number of different sectors um, of the red meat value chain to address a problem. Importantly, uh, it is a problem that is impacting the bottom line of both processors and producers. Um, the Rib Fracture Project is a partnership between processors, producers, scientific and research in institutions, industry bodies, um, with the support of state and local governments. Uh, this is, a value, um, is, is the value of a cluster approach um, in bringing together the supply chain to address a problem uh, with an outcome that benefits all sectors. Uh, our first speaker tonight is uh, Dr Kirsty Cordon. Uh, Kirsty came from a farming background uh, near Strathalbyn, South Australia, uh, which has led her to a lasting interest in primary production, agriculture and animal health. As a result, she um, pursued study in agriculture science at uh, CSU Wagga Wagga, New South Wales. Uh, upon graduation, Kirsty pursued a passion for horses um, and managed thoroughbred stud farms and trained a few racehorses. Curiosity and a thirst for further knowledge in animal health and performance um, and a continued passion for agriculture led her to return to tertiary studies at the University of Adelaide uh, to, to pursue a veterinary medicine uh, later in life. After working in private practice in southern Queensland and the Adelaide Hills, Kirsty decided to return to Strathalbyn and uh, take on the role of the Enhanced Abattoir Surveillance Program Manager with PERSA in early 2017. So tonight, Kirsty will present an overview of the Enhanced Abattoir Surveillance Program, uh, which she currently manages. Thanks, Carlin. Thanks, Tiffany. It's Carlin back again. Just before we hear from Kirsty, I just want to um, grab some feedback from the audience out there tonight, and I'm just going to launch a few polls um, to get some feedback on. The first one I'd like your feedback on, um, simply do this by clicking on your screen. Um, where are you listening from tonight? So just take a moment um, to click those options and this will give um, Kirsty and our second speaker, Colin, um, some feedback on the audience tonight. So I'll just give you a few more moments to click on those options. Okay, so the results show that 50% of the audience is from that southeast region and um, the majority of the rest is really from all within South Australia. And there's a couple of you um, coming from other parts of South Australia. Uh, so just another background poll question. Um, what's your occupation? Primary producer, consultant, advisor? Are you in the agribusiness sector? Are you a researcher or are you a student? Again, if you'd all just like to click on the screen and provide us with that feedback. So I can see that most of you are, 64% of you tonight are primary producers and 28% are consultants. And the remainder of the group is made up by researchers. Okay, the last polling question as a bit of context for uh, this evening is a question specific to the topic. Have you had a trace back or been aware of rib fractures? in your lambs? Yes, no or unsure? So 
I'll give you a few more moments. I can see that uh, three quarters of you have clicked there. All right, most of you have voted, so I'll close that one off. And the results there show that 33% of you have had a trace back. Uh, and a, but about 50% of you have said no and the remainder aren't sure. So what I'm going to do now, folks, is I'm just going to pass the baton across to Kirsty and we will learn about her, her surveillance program. Thanks, Carolyn. I don't have anything on my screen here. Are you there, Kirsty? We can we can see your um, screen. We just need to see your PowerPoint. Have you got it there? Oh, it's up on my screen. Sorry, Carolyn. I can't see your. Oh, oh God. No, you should have presenting. No, I've got nothing. I'll try again. Sorry folks, just one moment. Uh -huh. There we are. Thank you. Sorry about that. Oh, oh, Kirsty. Can you see that? Can you see that now? Yes, away you go. Excellent. Thanks, Carolyn, and thanks, Tiffany, for the introduction. Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Um, my name is Kirsty Corden, um, and I'm here today to give you a brief talk about uh, the South Australian Enhanced Abattoir Surveillance Program. Um, I'll give you some background information on the program, why these conditions we, that we monitor are important and how the data is collected fed back and fed back to producers and how to interpret the results. I'll also touch on areas that, where the data is used and this rib fracture research is a very good example of this. It's also worth noting that each state monitors and reports on endemic diseases and conditions very differently compared to South Australia, and we are very unique in the data that we collect and the methods that we use to distribute this information directly back to the producers. So what are the aims of our program and why is it important? So, I mean, it's simply a, a direct feedback system from the processing plant to producers that just lets them know what diseases and conditions were found in their line of sheep with the ultimate aim of improving stock health and welfare and to maximise productivity and in producing a consistent quality product just like cans of Coca-Cola, which means improving everyone's bottom line at the end of the day. And this cannot be achieved without the knowledge that the conditions exist in the first place. And indirectly, the program assists the sheep industry broadly by reducing waste within the red meat value chain, provides data and trend information for research projects and is also there to support market access into the future. The conditions monitored are not notifiable and there are no compliance or fines associated with what we do. The program is a collaboration between a few different parties and it's been operating since 2007 at both Thomas Foods International Exporting Processing Plants, where there's one lo located at Lobethal in the Adelaide Hills and the other one is at Murray Bridge. We're the only state in Australia that is fortunate enough to be predominantly funded directly by industry, that is the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund, which is managed by SAFAG or the South Australian Sheep Advisory Group, with a smaller national contribution from Animal Health Australia. So the program looks at 21 different disease or diseases or conditions that are detected at slaughter and we provide feedback to producers consigning these lines. So just to let you know that South Australia is currently the only state collecting information on rib fractures. So it is not known how common and widespread the issue is in other parts of Australia, but we suspect it's not just a South Australian problem. The reason that we're finding it here is because we're actively looking for it and reporting on it, but we just don't know to what extent interstate lambs are affected at this point in time. And without this data, we would not be aware that the conditions such uh, would not be aware that conditions such as rib fractures are such a significant issue that warrants further investigation. So on your screen, you can see. Um, these are some of the conditions that we monitor. On the far left hand side um, you've got a grass seed abscess which would require a significant amount of trim that would lose that entire brisket depending on how far that abscess tracked. In the middle we've got some dog bites um, and on the far right hand side um, some bruising. So the grass seed abscesses you might not be aware of. Um, the dog bites they are quite obviously severe um, but quite preventable and the bruising until the um, until they're processed, uh, that producers are unaware that these conditions exist. So 
So I'll just go a little bit into how this, how our program works um, and we'll just highlight how we collect the data on the processing floor and get the information back to the sheep producers. So the program provides an additional meat inspector on the ground covering both shifts at Murray Bridge and the one shift that's operated at Lobosaw to help collect the data and feed it back to us so we can pass the information back to producers within just a week or so after they've been processed. So on the processing floor, this team of meat inspectors work together inspecting and checking the red and green offal trays and each carcass as it moves along the chain. At the end of each individual consignment, they record an estimated percentage of each of the conditions present within the line. The meat inspectors are asked to record this estimate starting from 5% and in increments of 5%. As we want to provide feedback on flock issues, not individual condemnations or very low prevalence issues where just a few sheep are affected and the condemnation information is given directly by the processor. Um, so we feel as though we, we don't need to provide that again. All lines are monitored. However, we only request that lines over 100 head at Murray Bridge and more than 50, line, uh, and 50 head at Lobosol are reported back to the producer. And for any of you who have had the chance to be on the processing floor will appreciate how fast the chain moves. So it becomes extremely difficult to accurately estimate a trend in a small line when the line starts and stops in a matter of minutes. And of course, if there are major issues in these small lines, it is recorded, but it's just not necessarily, um, these lines just generally aren't re reported back. These estimates are information collected um, and the information collected by the meat inspectors is then emailed to us at PERSA uh, where it is validated, which basically means that the pick numbers are cross-checked to ensure that they match the owner or the trading name supplied by the processor. And the purpose of this is to ensure that the correct information is sent to the correct owner of the sheep. This client confidentiality is a critical aspect to the integrity of this program and we are very fortunate to be in the position to cross-check with the pick information held by government where we hold the database information for the state. So in regards to feedback, a producer receives a letter with all the information regarding them relating to their line. The number at the bottom is the percent of the line affected. So in this case, 5% of the line was found to have rib fractures. That's not five animals affected, that's a percent. And bladder worm, 10%, sheep measles, 5%. Feedback is only provided when a condition is detected in 5% or more. And, is currently, and we currently do not provide information on clean lines. And likewise, feedback is not sent if a producer does not consign the sheep directly to the processor. And although sale yard lines are monitored, there is no traceback. And just to let you all know that clean lines and results will soon be available via email notification in the near future, in addition to postal letters. So um, clean line information will soon be available. And just an example of our fact sheets that we also send out. So for any positive conditions, a fact sheet is provided with each letter. Um, which describes in limited detail what is found. So the fact sheet tells you, tells you about what the condition is, why it's important, and what impacts it has both on farm and during processing, and what might the cause be, treatment, management, and prevention options. This is a fairly generic um, source of information and should be used as a starting point when considering your approach to management and control strategies. And is useful as a discussion point when involving ad advisors or vets when further assistance is needed to tailor a strategy that suits your own individual production and management system for a particular issue that you might have been notified of that you might want to do something about. So we send out a lot of these letters. So this um, table has been created just to try and make sense of some of the rather long list of conditions and where we've um, divided it into where the effects are seen. So um, there are some conditions that predominantly have an effect on farm whereas at the processor, from a producer's point of view, they have little or no effect. Um, so cirrhosis, nephritis and lungworm. These are conditions that affect offal, um, such as the liver and the kidneys. However, it's important to still remember that these conditions result in industry waste. Um, that is in the rendering of offal and that would normally end up as a saleable product. There are other conditions um, that have little or no effect on farm. However, the impact on the carcass at the processor um, is quite significant. Um, so things like ovus, blood worm, um, vaccination lesions, dog bites um, don't necessarily affect the productivity of sheep on farm but there is a lot of wastage during processing. Um, and the final category 
um, are those conditions that have an impact at both a farm and, and processor level. And the most significant of these is grass seeds, um, pleurisy and arthritis, and you'll notice that reflect rib fractures, cheesy gland and jaundice are also on that list. Um, so just highlights the importance of um, the work that Colin's doing and the impact of, of rib fractures um, in sheep in South Australia. So any part of the carcass that is defective must be removed to satisfy the customer's requirements and the amount of trim removed to obtain this can be quite significant. A loss of trim not only reduces carcass weight but also incurs grid penalties, downgrading to a lower value often frozen product rather than a high value chilled product. And worst case scenario, the entire carcass can be condemned at times. So if we consider arthritis, um, this can have both significant economic um, consequences on farm and during processing. So the on-farm impacts um, include poor growth and reduced productivity of both meat and wool, a failure to thrive, and they can be late finishes, possibly mortalities, and often producers are left with um, animals that are not fit to load to be sold anywhere, um, and then they have to deal with those. And of course, trim loss during the processing can lead to an entire carcass condemnation. So when they trim, they need to take back to the next clean joint. So this can mean a loss of an entire hind leg, an entire forequarter, or they can lose all of their legs, or if there are four or more joints involved, then the whole carcass is actually condemned. Um, and with the feedback, um, conditions such as arthritis um, can often be reduced by um, looking at vaccinating uh, using Aerovac, which is um, Erysipelas is the most common cause of arthritis in sheep in South Australia, looking at hygiene at marking, um, looking at ways to reduce stress and at the end of the day maximising wound healing time. Um, so you can see that the loss of loss of that hind leg is consider a considerable loss to the producer and it's a considerable loss of valuable product to the processor. Um, so a little bit of research has happened um, with with arthritis um, using some of our data as well um, and tail length was found to be a significant contributor to arthritis um, where tail docking um, less than three vertebrae um, had a significant um, impact on the rate that the wound was healing and it was taking a lot longer to heal. Um, so um, making sure that you've got three or more vertebrae is important in reducing your um, incidence of arthritis and could be one factor. Um, amongst many factors on farm that need, need to be looked at. So, um, so interpretation of our results, um, it's important to consider which diseases are present and what impact they're having to the producer or the processor. Are they homebred or bought in sheep? Um, and how much of a line is affected? You can have 40% of a line of bruised animals, but they may be only mildly affected or they could be severely affected. So looking at your kill sheets, looking at your feedback information and determining carcass weights, are they more than normal, are they well under normal and, and determining where the losses could be if they're not what you expect. Um, and you know, you need to look at whether it's cost effective, can you can you cost effectively manage your issue on farm? Um, for a condition like uh, sheep measles, if you've got uh, wild dogs that are on your property um, that you can't control, then, then managing that condition may be very difficult or, or impossible. So um, just looking at all of these things in conjunction um, will help make management decisions a lot easier. And then I guess looking at um, are there sudden changes in results or are you seeing more of a certain condition, there can be great value in that, in that feedback going back to producers where they can, where they are alerted to a problem that they may, may not have had in the past. Um, I guess in caution to that, if you don't send your sheep to a processing plant such as Thomas Foods International um, where that's the only processing plant that's actively part of our program currently, um, they won't be receiving necessarily the same feedback. So just because you send to an abattoir um, and you don't get feedback doesn't mean that you don't have the condition, it just may mean that they're not monitoring for those conditions and, and letting you know. And in any management change, um, just be patient because nothing, it may not 
the results may not happen overnight. It might take several years to reduce your incidence, so um, being prepared for that. So our ultimate aim is to provide sheep producers in South Australia with the information that they utilise on farm when making sheep health management decisions and to decrease the degree of disease on farm. So hopefully that gives you all an idea of how our producer feedback system operates here in South Australia. Um, and I think we're going to field a few questions um, and then I'll hand over to Colin and he'll explain how he's used this information in his fracture research. So thank you everyone for joining us and please feel free to leave a comment um, and if you wish to know more about our feedback program or if you have any further questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Kirsty. Um, I've got a couple of questions here that the audience has typed in. Um, the first one you might be able to answer, but Colin might also provide some insight into his presentation. And the first question says, how often is the rib damage caused in transit compared to older injuries? That would be a Colin question. I think I, from our information, we don't have that sort of data, um, but that might okay. be something that Colin's looked at. Do you yes, want to I'm pass that one, Colin, <laughs> to your presentation? Oh, look, I'm, I can happily answer that now. I'll just say that um, in the uh, study we did of 30,000 lambs at Bordertown Abattoirs, um, less than 1% were uh, injuries that had been incurred during transit to the uh, abattoirs. So, yeah, the vast majority occur on farm uh, at an earlier age. Okay, thanks, Colin, and we're about to gain some further insights into that shortly. Um, there's another question here, Kirsty, in regards to your comment about tail length. The person yes. says, um, short tail takes longer to heal. Can you just explain your tail length um, comments again, please? Yes, so um, from the research that was done, um, they made a strong correlation between a shorter tail length, um, less than three vertebrae long, um, and, and tail length three or more. Um, and there was a definite correlation and a reduced incidence of arthritis in the in sheep with the longer tails than shorter and um, the, the thoughts are that the the, um, the wound takes longer to heal so there's more a longer exposure to the bacteria that's quite common uh, in the environment um, so there's more of a chance that they're going to pick that bacteria up and get the infection which causes the arthritis. Okay so that just clarified that question the person was just asking. Yep the shorter tail takes longer to heal and yep, you've just clarified that, yep. so thank you. Um, is there any further questions from the attendees um, for Kirsty, or we might pick them up um, as we go to the end. Um, we'll do some questions again. Um, there's one here before um, Tiffany introduces Colin. So there's a question here that says, what proportion of farmers acknowledge the feedback and what proportion take corrective action um, that you know of, Kirsty, as a result of getting these reports from you? Um, I, I couldn't give you, I mean, we've done a survey to see what people think of our, our information and that's been very positive. I do field a lot of, quite a few phone calls um, during the week of producers ringing me about conditions um, that they've been notified of and they just want further clarification or some more information on. Um, to give you a, I couldn't give you sort of numbers, um, but we do field regular calls on producers wanting more information um, and we haven't really studied how many people are, I mean I think in our survey about 40% were saying that they were making on farm changes. That was a survey done about a year ago, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're going to build on that as Tiffany introduces our next speaker. Thanks, thanks, Carlin. Um, so our second speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Colin Trengrove. Um, for those of you in the southeast or in South Australia, he's, he's fairly well known. Um, Colin is a production animal veterinarian at the School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences, University of Adelaide, Roseworthy campus. Uh, he's currently finalising research towards, towards his uh, PhD into the cause and prevention of rib fractures in sheep. Previously, he has run his own livestock consultancy business, ProAg Consulting, uh, as well as working in private veterinary practice um, as a district vet with the Department of Primary Industries, South Australia, um, in the southeast, mid and upper north, and um, Eyre Peninsula. Uh, he was also a founding director um, of the APOW Soil and Plant Analysis Lab, uh, based in Adelaide. 
So tonight Colin's going to give us an update on his PhD and his findings uh, into the cause and prevention of rib fractures in lambs. Thanks, Colin. Thank you, Carlin, and thank you for the intro, Tiff, uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, yes, so this, uh, as has already been stated, this is the culmination of um, probably four years of uh, planning and research, but my interest in rib fractures goes back beyond 25 years when I first, uh, it was reported to me by a producer down the southeast, and so uh, it's been an issue that's been around for a long time, but there is little awareness of rib fractures uh, in lambs because it is not a condition that is normally uh, recorded or reported in abattoirs uh, generally. Uh, but as Kirsty has just highlighted, the information has now been recorded for nine years through the Enhanced Abattoir Surveillance Program in South Australia, funded by the uh, Sheep Industry Fund. And so it's based on that information that um, we'd, we've been able to, um, I guess, garner enough uh, information to I investigate this further. So the topics I would like to cover is firstly talking about rib fracture detection, a review of the causes based on literature, uh, what's the results of the research done to date, uh, and then the prevention strategies that have been developed as a result of those studies, uh, a little bit about the cost to the industry, uh, what's intended down the track, and of course the acknowledgements. So, uh, the Australian food standards dictate that rib fractures, or calluses as they're probably more correctly referred to, um, such as these in the, uh, the picture in the top left hand corner, uh, need to be excised before the carcass is fit for human consumption. And so, uh, for example, in the JBS at the uh, border town abattoirs, uh, a pneumatic saw is used to remove the damaged ribs uh, while the uh, lamb is, when its rib fractures are first detected, they're put onto a retain rail, the uh, ribs are removed, and as a result of that, the, uh, the rack is often compromised. Uh, and uh, instead of being worth, say, $25 a kilogram, it's um, only uh, reduced to uh, a salvage a salvage value of probably 20% that value. So you can see here that um, as a result of cutting out the, um, the ribs, there's quite a, a hole left in the carcass where there's several ribs affected, uh, and this results in the rack which, which is uh, subsequently damaged. Uh, so both of these racks in this illustration or photo here uh, have been compromised in the process of removing the rib fractures and so they don't meet the uh, market specifications. Uh, for the US market that's a, a 10 centimetre uh, length of rib as indicated in the, uh, the packaged export product on the right. Uh, and there is typically over 100,000 primal cuts downgraded annually in South Australia due, due to rib fractures which is estimated to cost the uh, South Australian red meat industry around about three uh, million annually. So a review of the literature uh, in identified several potential uh, causes. Uh, so Eagles and Small uh, back in 2008 reported uh, physical injury as a major cause of rib fractures uh, in the EU and uh, UK, especially where the U inadvertently steps on the lamb. Uh, they also describe the influence of vitamin D, calcium and copper on bone strength and development. And Hiteroglu in 1980 highlighted the importance of the role of several trace elements in bone formation and development. So there's been a lot known for a long time, uh, but little has been done to perhaps to resolve the issue. And so a research strategy was developed uh, to examine these causes um, in the Australian context. Uh, firstly, I'd like to just uh, briefly discover, uh, report a uh, field observations, and I've had several of these, especially from uh, Victoria, uh, from veterinarians in practice, and this one from uh, Dr. David Randell in the Hamilton Practice um, Livestock Logic, where he found rib fractures um, uh, in a mob of uh, lambs that were being yarded for the first time, uh, around about six to ten weeks of age, uh, and found them collapsing with rib fractures. So. Uh, in this case about 40 lambs. Uh, rib fractures were also apparent on post-mortem and, and liver copper levels were extremely low. So um, anecdotal evidence such as this strongly supports that copper deficiency plays a significant role or contributing to the incidence of uh, rib fractures and of course in this case um, uh, long bone fractures as well. The uh, map here indicates uh, traceback data from the Enhanced Abattoir Surveillance Program, uh, in this case in 2014 through uh, Thomas Foods International. 
So one in 25 lambs in South Australia have evidence of broken ribs uh, at slaughter and about nine in 10 properties send lambs to slaughter with evidence of broken ribs. Uh, and these come from all over the state as indicated on the map here where the, um, the rib fractures have, have been found up as far as the dog fence. In, uh, indicated by the black dots on the map uh, as opposed to the grey dots which represent uh, negative feedback uh, or properties that haven't had a problem. So this is all based on the EAS data as described by Kirsty in the previous presentation. And uh, I guess it highlights uh, one thing is that it's not actually unique to any part of the, high, you know, the necessarily the higher rainfall parts of the state. And the other thing I'd like to add here is that, um, okay, these black dots, dots uh, indicating rib fractures represent where the estimated prevalence has been over 5%. And in actual fact, uh, the study I've recently completed at Bordertown shows that it's uh, much more common than that as you'd expect because these dots are only representing where there's been at least 5% incidence or, pre or prevalence, should I say. So we initially, uh, funding was initially obtained from MLA to look at a, a neonatal lamb investigation uh, several years ago where we uh, enrolled 29 farms in a study to test the hypothesis that rib fractures have primarily occurred during birth as has been speculated by many producers uh, and due primarily to copper deficiency which is another commonly held belief. Uh, we ended up doing 119 autopsies on lambs that were dead at birth or shortly after and uh, revealed only two with broken ribs. We also collected liver and bone and pasture samples uh, at the same time and we looked at uh, various mineral associations with this condition. We found no apparent association between liver copper levels or bone density uh, and properties that had a history of rib fractures. However, we recognised that this sample size was pretty small. A pasture analysis, however, uh, did reveal a strong correlation uh, between nutrient levels that we'd normally associate with soil acidity and the properties that had a history of rib fractures. Uh, and so this led to the following uh, study here. So this uh, plot uh, was undertaken to explore the uh, potential association between soil pH uh, from soil maps produced by the CSRO and rib fracture prevalence, so based on the, that EAS data from 2014. So it reveals here the prevalence of rib fractures, um, rib fracture positive properties, uh, which is represented on the y-axis. So this is properties positive uh, to rib fractures per 100 properties at risk. And then across the uh, horizontal axis, we have the uh, P, soil pH, uh, water pH. So we find a um, a, a distinct correlation here where properties with a higher prevalence of rib fractures are also associated with um, the more acidic soil types. Uh, this is quite plausible association given that uh, calcium intake is critical to bone strength and calcium deficiency is closely associated with uh, soil acidity or increasing soil acidity. So moving on to the um, abattoir study completed last spring at uh, JBS where we uh, observed 30,000 lambs uh, over a two week period uh, going, going through along the slaughter chain and we found that a prevalence of about four, just over 4% uh, with rib fractures but the range was from 0 to 18%. An average of 21 lambs had rib fractures per line, uh, the average line was 500 lambs so a line or a consignment from a property. And 90% of the properties that presented lambs during this period uh, had lambs with roof fractures. Uh, and in fact, fractures were detected in all lines presented during that time that exceeded more, uh, 260 lambs. So it was only generally the smaller lines um, of 100 or so that where we didn't find rib fractures. A third of properties had rib fractures in excess of 5%. And, uh, and an average prevalence in these lines was 8%. And this is, compares quite uh, closely to the, an average of 9% prevalence found in the uh, EAS studies over the last nine years. Now this uh, 
diagram may look a bit difficult to interpret initially, but what we have here is a density plot which simulates a lamb carcass hanging vertically with their head up the top end. And uh, so the uh, red spots here are the uh, spine, and then we have the, uh, the rib cage on both sides. So, and we can see here there's perhaps poor to uh, see, but the uh, ribs numbered from one down to uh, 13 on the vertical axis. And across the uh, horizontal axis, we have the uh, centimetres from the um, spine out to um, the exterior of the um, rib cage out here at 16 centimetres. The, uh, the illustration is representing over nearly 1,300 lambs with rib fractures and the uh, increase in density represents where the more prevalence or where rib fractures were found to be more prevalent. So it's highlighting that um, the, if we look across here that uh, most of the rib fractures are occurring between ribs uh, 8 and 10 on both sides, on the left and right side and uh, the rib fractures are occurring on average or mostly between about uh, 10 and 14, 15 centimetres from the spine, so getting close to the uh, exterior of the rib cage. To illustrate it another way, graphically, look at a, uh, an anatomical diagram of a lamb, and we see that about 75% of rib fractures occurred on ribs 8, 9 and 10, around about 10 to 14 centimetres. So that's where uh, these uh, yellow stars are representative, and so why were most of the rib fractures occurring in this area? Well, if you um, look at the uh, anatomy of the lamb, we find that um, effectively the first seven ribs are largely protected by the shoulder and foreleg, and the uh, the last three ribs are really uh, are somewhat more protected because they're tucked in, uh, in over the abdomen. And so it's the uh, ribs eight, nine, and ten which are the most vulnerable to any sort of injury. And so this would indicate that um, you know, physical injury must be playing a role in this because it's um, obviously affecting the ribs that are, that are most vulnerable. So looking at the on-farm survey, so during the abattoir study of 30,000 lambs that represented 75 lines from 60 properties. And so an on-farm property survey was conducted amongst those 60 producers. And the findings to date indicate that over 90% were at risk to copper deficiency uh, based on primarily on the soil analysis. And looking more closely at the soil analysis, we see that uh, nearly uh, three quarters of the uh, properties um, had copper potential or at risk to copper deficiency based on interaction with iron and or molybdenum, which were there in, in excess. Just over half the properties had acid soils uh, and an acid soil was defined using the pH in water of being less than 6.3. 72% had uh, what is considered calcium deficiency which correlates with, uh, I guess, closely with an acid soil, although sometimes um, you can have an alkaline soil due to an excess of potash or magnesium but still have a calcium deficiency and that's why the discrepancy between these two figures. Uh, 19 properties had more than 5% rib fractures, which is that uh, same criteria used for the EAS data. And of these 19 properties, 100% were deficient in either cattle, uh, calcium, copper or both. And the, uh, the copper deficiency in, in this case, 89% were deficient due to the interaction with iron and molybdenum, which uh, I think draws to an important point here because during the survey, I found that several producers were spreading copper as a fertiliser, uh, partly to prevent the, perhaps the occurrence of rib fractures. But if it's a copper-induced uh, deficiency due to an iron excess or a molybdenum excess, or for that matter, a sulphur excess, uh, that copper fertiliser won't have any or have minimal impact on improving the copper status of the uh, animals uh, grazing that pasture. For those that are more statistically inclined, looking at some of the correlations in the soil analysis, we find uh, strong correlations between iron, uh, calcium, uh, soil pH, and for that matter, organic carbon, uh, and the uh, prevalence of rib fractures. Uh, and you might say, you know, what does that represent? Well, in actual fact, um, iron increases and calcium or pH and organic carbon all tend to decrease with increasing soil acidity. Uh, and uh, so that's a quite a, 
a significant correlation uh, and sort of backs, backs up the data that I presented in the previous slide. And also the fact that uh, increasing iron associated with increasing acidity is also um, it ties up the copper and so reduces copper availability. So the conclusion from this uh, data so far is that uh, rib fractures are mainly due to um, initially I think an underlying issue is handling or accident and so that's why we tend to see rib fractures uh, from sheep presented to slaughter from all over the state but we do see a higher prevalence of rib fractures occurring in lines from for example Kangaroo Island, the Flurio Peninsula uh, and the mid and lower southeast, in other words generally the higher rainfall areas of the state uh, and this I put down to being more commonly associated with uh, calcium and or copper deficiency and there is also in the literature the issue of vitamin D deficiency which can predispose to, to bone fragility uh, although I didn't look at that in this particular uh, study. So as we, um, in the process of doing the on-farm investigation, looking at uh, how we may prevent rib fractures, I saw a vast array of different handling equipment and one of the criticisms, uh, once again levelled by producers, has been is that a result of the increasing incidence of um, mechanical handling devices in more recent times. However, the, um, the rib fracture distribution was such that it was on average there was only about two rib fractures per uh, lamb and so it represented more of a pinpoint injury rather than a crushing industry, so, uh, injury and so for example the use of these uh, mechanical or hydraulically operated uh, capturing devices I don't see as being a, a significant issue in, in the incidence of rib fractures. I see it as more a, a problem with uh, perhaps uh, particular sharp points or uh, sharp objects that might be uh, impinging on the lamb as they run past or getting squashed against a post by the ewe or, or similar sort of ep episodes. And so um, there is obviously an opportunity in many yards to improve the um, the quality of the equipment and, and reduce the risk of rib fractures. So for example this illustration here on the bottom right where we have um, a, a good flow into a, um, a narrow raceway to prevent the animals uh, sort of being too abreast in the raceway but also no sharp objects which might impinge on a rib in the process of going in there. And then on the bottom left we have rubberized uh, drafting gates uh, which also will tend to reduce the risk of um, breaking ribs as through the drafting process which I thought I'm um, sure could be an issue. So I see uh, interim advice on how rib fractures can be prevented. One is to ensure that there's adequate calcium and copper uptake by the animal. I, I do uh, specifically refer to uptake as opposed to intake because um, it may go into the rumen but it doesn't necessarily get into the animal because uh, copper and sulphur and iron and molybdenum can all combine to um, form an insoluble complex uh, and so it's not absorbed by the animal. So in other words we really need to be ideally basically putting copper uh, through a, either a, a bolus dose to ensure that enough gets absorbed out of the rumen or preferably perhaps uh, as an inject injectable form uh, so that it's bypassing the uh, tie-ups that occur that can occur in the rumen. So how do we know if the animals have, are getting an adequate calcium or copper uptake? So a soil test to check the need for whether there is a calcium deficiency and so there may be a benefit in, pro in providing either lime or dolomite or gypsum depending on the circumstance. Uh, we can do uh, blood tests on, on ewes at around joining time because you really need to establish the uh, copper status of the ewe. I think a lot of these deficiencies may be occurring during pregnancy and so the lambs are being born perhaps with copper deficiency and or calcium deficiency and they're so more fragile to um, injury thereafter. So checking the EU copper status at joining, uh, which is obviously uh, often in spring or thereafter, depending on uh, when lambs are proposed to be born. Uh, alternatively, doing a pasture test uh, when you've still got green feed on offer in spring to assess if there is a risk of copper, sulphur, iron and molybdenum tie-ups occurring or inter interactions which can induce uh, copper deficiency. So by doing a pasture test we can make an assessment about the likely uh, availability of copper uh, in that circumstance. And if we find that there are a, is a potential for interactions we're likely to see a copper deficiency induced well then we would need to uh, ensure that copper is given it directly to the animal as opposed to being applied as a foliar spray on pasture or as a uh, fertiliser additive uh, onto the soil. 
uh, and an additional check of uh, lamb, copper, uh, and for that matter other trace elements uh, could be warranted at marking or weaning to see um, how their status is progressing. The next issue I see is important to preventing root fractures and this is perhaps the wider issue of um, I think a lot of properties that are having one, two or three percent with rib fractures uh, is probably primarily due to handling issues and so adopting management strategies to minimise the risk of lamb trauma. So being gentle when handling because um, if you ever do a post-mortem on a lamb or for that matter um, you may have noticed that sometimes you don't have to put too much pressure on the rib cage to break a rib and, uh, and so being gentle, uh, realising that lambs are quite fragile at an early age. Uh, perhaps reviewing the use of dogs in yards, I'm not saying that all dogs are bad because uh, I realise that if the animals are acclimatised to dogs that's a, that's a help but lambs are usually quite skittish and are probably more prone to um, jumping on top of each other or injuring each other or, or um, getting injured as a result of uh, the uh, access to dogs. Another issue is minimising the need to yard lambs. So only uh, perhaps dividing the lambs up and only uh, drafting off the heavies to go to slaughter rather than having them all in the yards each time for for um, uh, yarding. Uh, although I did find in the survey that there wasn't a distinct correlation between the number of times lambs were yarded and uh, the incidence of rib practice. Uh, and the final point there is uh, attending to hazards in the yards. So any any situation in the yards that might be predisposing to rib fractures um, should be eliminated. I appreciate that's easily said, not necessarily easily done. Uh, now to finish up with just the cost of rib fractures. So firstly, uh, there's three aspects to this: the producer, the uh, the process, the producer, and the industry. So the processor initially. So based on estimates from JBS, um, the uh, on a on average, um, you know, killing several thousand lambs a day, that uh, chain disruption as a result of uh, having to trim uh, lambs with rib fractures results in about $1,500 a day on, on average. Uh, the uh, discount caused by lambs with rib fractures, um, a discounted brack of lamb, uh, resulting in about $4,500 a day, as I said, you know, the, um, it can reduce the value of a rack by 80% uh, if it's been damaged in the process of trimming. Uh, and this all equates to around about $25 per lamb with root fractures, a cost of $25 per lamb with root fractures. If we look at the cost of the producer, we see here that uh, it's estimated that um, rib fractures will reduce the growth rate of lambs by around about three weeks. I mean, this will depend on whether you've got one, two, three or ten ribs affected, uh, which looking at the value of the pasture grown may equate to around about $1.30 per head. Uh, there's also the trimming cost. Now trimming, as I said, there's only an average of about two ribs affected per lamb. So the actual trimming doesn't cost a lot per se. It might only estimate around about $1.30 per lamb. And then the other aspect is we don't really know is what's the risk of losing sale as a result of being, a, I guess, a repeat offender of submitting lambs with a significant number of broken ribs, you know, especially with some lines of, you know, of lambs having 10 or 20% of lambs affected with broken ribs. Uh, that's an unknown. And then the uh, cost to the industry. Well, there's the welfare aspect, which um, yeah, that's once again, it's, a, it's an unquantifiable, but um, like all these things, it's best to address these issues early before they uh, become an issue. Uh, from a South Australian perspective, where it's estimated about 3 million lambs are cured annually, if we, if we base it on the 4% prevalence discovered in this study, uh, and the $25 cost per lamb with a rib fracture, that works out about $3 million a year to the industry. Uh, and that figure can be arrived at through the various calculations uh, and it comes to a similar figure. If we expanded that to this Australian situation where we have about 21, 22 million lambs killed annually, uh, yeah, that could be costing the industry over 20 million a year. But um, as Kirsty referred to, we don't have the data on the prevalence of rib fractures in other states because it's not information that's collated. And so unless studies are done in a state, we won't be able to quantify that figure further. So um, looking at further research, uh, also looking to do further ageing of fractures and mineral studies on the bone composition of lambs that have got weak bones as opposed to strong bones. Uh, refining that advice to producers that I just outlined previously and uh, looking at perhaps ideally doing similar studies in other states.
Uh, and finally, um, ultimately, we want to improve the uh, abattoir feedback to producers, and so um, any feedback that uh, producers have on that matter would be uh, much appreciated. So in finishing, I'd uh, just like to acknowledge uh, my PhD supervisors, uh, MLA, JBS and PERSA for their assistance through the various means. Uh, there's also the National Sheep Industry and Health Australia through their um, abattoir surveillance, the uh, Sheep Industry Fund for the EAS funding on an ongoing basis, uh, TFI for their assistance, uh, uh, Samri and also um, uh, Professor Mark Stevenson for their help with some of the uh, studies done. So on that point, I would uh, like to finish up and say thank you for listening and, and I uh, welcome any questions. Over to you, Carlin. Thanks, Colin. Um, I've got a couple of questions here. One related um, back to when you were talking about um, the initial copper deficiency slide. Um, so the question was, did you verify copper deficiency in the lambs by blood or tissue testing as opposed to soil testing, which does not necessarily reflect the actual animal status? And I then think in your presentation you went on to talk about actual um, blood testing from the animals um, at um, marking, I think you talked about it as well. Yes, uh, yes, that's a good point. Now, what we did do, um, so the 60 uh, producers, uh, we sampled uh, five livers from each line of lambs as they came through. And uh, admittedly, so this was in late November, early December, and we found a third of the uh, properties had evidence of uh, deficiency. So in other words, one or more of the livers that we sampled was, was uh, grossly deficient in copper. And uh, so I thought that was interesting in that um, by the time we get to late November, December, we may not necessarily, it's not the peak time necessarily for seeing copper deficiency, but the fact that we found a third of properties um, at that one point in time had evidence of copper deficiency uh, was quite relevant. And uh, so, yeah, th th it's a fair comment that obviously testing livers is the ideal, that's, I guess, the gold standard for, for finding um, in particular uh, copper deficiency, but uh, we can make some various predictions from the soil and, and from that, for that matter from pasture analysis on the likelihood of copper deficiency occurring, but um, there's no doubt liver uh, sampling uh, either at slaughter or doing a biopsy technique, getting your local veterinarian to do a biopsy on say seven to ten animals is perhaps the most uh, direct method of finding copper deficiency uh, and to a lesser extent the uh, blood test uh, is a is a reasonable predictor. It depends on the time of the year as to how effective the blood test is. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Um, thanks, Colin. Um, just following up from that that same person has just um, text. Um, I typed in a question. Was there any correlation between the incidence of low liver copper and the incidence of rib fractures on those properties? Uh, yes. Um, I've actually got the uh, the data right in front of me. So as I said, um, the properties that had, uh, so there are, yeah, 18 properties that actually had uh, copper deficiency based on liver analysis of the lambs. And it wasn't necessarily, I mean, we just sampled, sampled five lambs out of each line. We weren't sampling lambs that necessarily had rib fractures. So um, that was that was good. would be a much more difficult thing to try and organise because generally the livers are, livers are separated from the carcass before we get to a diagnose the uh, presence of rib fractures. Uh, but I did find a correlation between those with, uh, certainly with those with low copper. Uh, invariably, um, looking at the soil analysis, it was a, it's, copper deficiency was predicted. But, um, and in actual fact, there was a high correlation between the properties that had high prevalence, in other words, greater than 5% with rib fractures, and, uh, and the presence of uh, copper deficiency. However, I can also appreciate that just sampling five lambs from a line at one point in time is not necessarily the, you know, the, the best way of d detecting copper deficiency. I think it'd be you know, far more relevant, obviously, to be going on farm and, and looking at animals that might be a bit um, backward in condition. Obviously, the lambs that are going to slaughter are going to be the ones in best condition, and so possibly the less likely to to necessarily have a copper deficiency show up. 
Okay, um, thank you. We'll give um, Colin a rest for a moment. I think there's a couple of questions here that were directed back to the first presentation. Um, Kirsty, um, the question was, will we find out what our loss has been on effective carcasses? Sorry, can you just repeat that question? Will we find out what our loss has been on effective carcasses? On effective carcasses by conditions, is that what the... Yeah, they've written so effective, no, but um, sorry, means affected. Oh, sorry. Um, we don't know exactly how much trim is taken off um, at the at processing. Um, it's impossible to know um, what that would be. We don't get that feedback, and they don't record it. I mean, the line moves so quickly. Um, there's no way. I mean, they just have to remove it and go on to the next carcass. So it's yeah, it's um, unless research gets done um, where you go in and you weigh and take samples um, to try and estimate it. Um, but there'd be no way of knowing for your particular line how much loss there would be. I guess you're just comparing your carcass weights, looking at the conditions that were found and using the feedback to try and sort of join the dots is the best that you can do at this point in time. Um, yeah, without further studies, but yeah, to know um, losses of an individual line. Um, I don't think that's information that we'll ever know, I guess. Um, but yeah, I guess deducting it from the information that you presented with from your kill sheets, from the feedback, um, and just trying to work it out from there. Yeah, okay, I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, it appears that your slide about the lamb and the tail and stocking it at the appropriate at the appropriate spot has generated a bit of discussion. So the question is, yes. is there a difference between using a hot knife or rings for tail docking in regard to arthritis? That I don't know came out of the study. Um, from the information that I've seen, I'm not sure that um, that was actually looked at. Um, but I'm happy to look at that further if they would like to leave their information and I can get back to them on that. Yep, yep. So we've Is got a helpful? register of yep. those questions, um, Kirsty, so we'll be able to follow that up or there might be a paper right. that we could send yep. out to the participants. Or yeah, exactly. Like that. So sure. it seems yep. like that um, topic has drummed up a few questions, so that was good. All right. That's great. I think these Excellent. next ones are going to come back through to you, Colin. Um, uh -huh. Someone says, is there a difference between breeds, for example, Dorper, Second Cross Merino or Pure Merino? Have you noticed a trend there? Uh, look, it's interesting. I um, I recorded at least eight different breeds in the process of um, uh, uh, visiting the 60 properties, and so I think the data set's probably too small to be uh, very conclusive. Um, uh, admittedly, and I, and I, and I wouldn't uh, say it's at all statistically significant, but um, the five properties that had dorpers, none of them had rib fractures, but I might also add there that none of them submitted more than about 100 and I think the biggest line of Dorpers that was submitted was about 140, uh, and I really, uh, based on the uh, the analysis of the data, I think any line less than about 250 lambs is probably not going to give a, a reliable uh, or statistically significant result, because when we're only looking at about a 4% prevalence, um, you really probably need to be sampling at least two or probably 300 lambs uh, before you can produce what I'd say is a statistically significant result. So, so it was interesting, um, and I also found interesting that, um, in fact, I, I recall several of those DORPA uh, producers were also giving copper supplementation, and uh, so the fact that they didn't have evidence of copper deficiency, or should I say rib fractures, uh, may be also because of their management program as well. Uh, only about 20% of producers in the survey were providing copper as a supplement. And I did find that some of those I would have considered at risk to copper deficiency based on the soil analysis, but they uh, weren't presenting with rib fractures. Uh, there were others that were giving supplements and still having rib fracture problems as well. So uh, I think the, uh, the data, data set is too small to draw any conclusions about breed and susceptibility. Certainly there was a, there was a lot of uh, composite um, bre bred lambs in there as well as a, a mixture of British breeds and Merino and, and as I say, uh, Adorpers. But uh, at this stage, the data set is too small to really draw any significant conclusions. Okay, thanks, Colin. The next, there's got two more questions here coming in. Um, when it comes to marking, which is probably when the lambs are at their most vulnerable, they need to be drafted and often portable yards are used. What would you suggest farmers do to minimise those risks? 
Okay, well, I think, uh, to my mind, uh, invariably, I, th I think drafting is, is a big risk uh, where it is occurring, and I, th I think it's probably just a matter of um, attention to detail and being uh, and being careful. Now, I appreciate you know some of the producers have got um, you know ten or twenty thousand lambs, uh, and it's very hard to be diligent with um, with them like you might be with a with a few hundred, but. Uh, Basically, uh, not not rushing them into the yards, not causing them to be trampled, uh, not sort of, um, and we all know experiences where, um, you know, even the yard setup where they're being funneled from a large catching pen into a small catching pen, lambs are invariably going to be trodden on or squashed, uh, and that might be exacerbated by the presence of dogs. Um, but uh, I did actually um, make a subjective assessment during my survey where I I noted. Uh, talking to the producers and, and the um, as they detailed their management program that some were showing a lot of attention to detail whereas um, I thought others where there might have been uh, third parties involved or contractors or whatever perhaps that same attention to detail wasn't wasn't necessarily there and uh, I um, found what I would say a correlation a distinct correlation between uh, the prevalence of rib fractures and attention to detail, but I appreciate that was a very subjective assessment, so I didn't uh, put that in my um, my findings. However, I do think that um, talking to some producers, they obviously take a lot of care with their lamb lambs at handling, and uh, I suspect that would also be a major contributor to um, you know reduced prevalence of rib fractures if um, attention to detail is exercised. But um, all yards are going to be a, a unique circumstance, and um, and it's a lot of lot to do with producer attitudes to how they handle their stock. I think as to um, you know, the risk of rib fractures occurring. Okay, um, we've got some more two more questions here waiting in the queue. So this question is: Is a multi-mineral drench enough copper, or do you need direct copper injection with, um, or will a multi-mineral drench be enough? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, given that there isn't actually a registered uh, copper injection for sheep, uh, and I know that a lot of, um, you know, for example, um, a multi-min uh, cattle with copper in it is, is used in sheep, and one of the reasons that uh, copper injection is not uh, registered for use in sheep um, because it does cause a quite an adverse um, reaction in the tissue, uh, and so certainly if copper is being injected into um, sheep off label, it should be injected into areas that are a low value meat cut, in other words up behind the ear or somewhere like that. Um, I mean it does also cause tissue reactions in cattle as well, so uh, it's not that sheep are unique in that respect. So there's no doubt that injectable forms of copper are probably the most reliable way of getting copper into the system, but um, and there is that issue with if there's a lot of iron or molybdenum or sulphur in the diet, uh, obviously in the form of uh, usually in pasture intake, but it could be in some supplements as well, that that is going to tie up any copper that's put into the rumen. So if we're giving an oral drench of a multi-min or a nutrimin or whatever the um, product might be, um, you would hope that there's enough copper in there to uh, get some absorbed before it gets tied up by other um, uh, confounding uh, products. So having said that, um, it's very hard to say hard and fast that any one oral product is going to do the job uh, and that's why I think you really need to know, have, at least have done a um, pasture analysis at some stage to work out what the uh, the status of the uh, iron, sulphur and molybdenum is in the, in the pasture to work out whether the um, tie-ups are likely to occur. Um, yeah, so there's no no one answer there, and I think it's part of the reason why uh, rib fractures have been recognised as a problem for a long time, and probably will continue because it's not a um, a clear cut issue to deal with. Uh, I think if we had in more of our access to copper in an injectable form, that would be handy. Um, and we did do some re research some years ago with um, glass bullets, which had you know, copper, cobalt, selenium in them, which were, were found to be quite effective, but the market was never considered big enough in Australia. That I'm looking to re review that circumstances. But um, so generally we'd say a copper drench, for example, just a straight copper sulphate drench, uh, there's only about 1 or 2% of the copper is absorbed, but that's often enough to uh, meet the needs of the animal for a couple months. Uh, however, if there is, um, you know, as I say, those other confounding nutrients in the uh, in the diet, well, that may not be um, uh, as satisfactory. It's hard to say. Mm. 
um, it sounds like Colin, I'm just going to put out a bit of a professional disclaimer there that um, people might just need to consult with their vet or their livestock consultant because um, someone also has made a comment here that just need to be cautioned that um, copper is potentially toxic. Um, someone else has made that comment, but we just need to, you know, it sounds like this is quite a complex relationship here that you're explaining. Um, so just people might want to get some more advice on their specific situation before they go and apply this. Yeah, look, that's a good comment. I mean, the um, and it's the same with selenium. That um, you know, selenium and copper are considered you know, essential trace elements for normal animal production and health, but uh, they both can be toxic if given inappropriately or in, in excess. And so, um, it's not a good idea to just go out there and and treat animals um, indiscriminately with either of those products without knowing uh, what the uh, the risk of deficiency is in the first place. So, uh, yeah, consulting your animal health advisor is a good idea. Okay, we'll just take one final question tonight, Colin, and um, the question is in regards to pasture tests. Um, who provides the producers with the feedback on their pasture, pasture tests and what are the acceptable levels? Okay, yeah, well look, there's a lot of laboratories around the country that will do a, a pasture analysis and uh, if you're looking um, sort of more specifically for something like selenium, you've got to be very careful because it's only required in very small amounts and so you need to get a, a laboratory that does measure it down to um, 0.05 parts per million. But in the case of copper, I mean all pasture analyses will look at copper and uh, we'd normally say that um, we want to see a, uh, and that's it's not straightforward because we'd normally say you need to have at least five to five to seven parts per million of copper in a pasture analysis to um, to meet the animal needs of an animal. But the trouble is if you've um, if there's a significant amount of iron or sulphur or molybdenum present in that sample as well, then seven parts per million may not be enough. Uh, and so that's where you really do need a um, an animal health or a uh, someone with an agronomy consultant's uh, background who uh, knows the um, the significance of the um, the relationship between the various uh, confounding elements to see whether the copper is going to be there in, a, in abundance to meet animal needs. So um, I, I'd happily provide that um, that more detail to anyone who wants it. Um, but otherwise, if you uh, know uh, someone in the animal health or agronomy line. Um, that uh, can interpret pasture analyses, uh, that'd be a good way to go. Uh, however, yeah, I look. If anyone would like to contact me, I can. I can certainly provide that detail. Okay, thanks, Colin. There's a few more questions rolling in here, so um, we'll have a record of them, and uh, might be best just to um, follow them up because this one's going into more detail um, in regards to the pastures and things. So um, I'll provide these questions all through to Colin and Kirsty as our speakers tonight. Um, and they can then follow you up individually or it might be a topic that then can get passed through to Tiffany and she might be able to coordinate another webinar via the Limestone Coast Red Meat Cluster. So thanks everyone tonight. It's um, been a wealth of information shared by Colin and Kirsty, and obviously one hour wasn't quite enough to capture all these ideas and discussions. Um, apologies for the technology issues in the middle of it and thanks for those who sat with us as we problem solved that. Um, we will work on a recording of tonight and distribute that to all those who are registered and I'll try to edit out um, those awkward silences. So as you leave tonight, just to help Tiffany and the Limestone Coast Red Meat Cluster plan future webinars, could you just complete the evaluation survey that will pop up as you close your window? Um, thanks again to Colin and Kirsty. Tiffany, did you want to have any final comments to the group tonight? I'll hand over to you if so. Yeah, thanks, Carlin. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, everybody tonight for logging on and I uh, hope you found um, it a valuable um, session. I think webinars are kind of a, a new frontier for a lot of people um, and um, we certainly are going forward in the future and working with the Limestone Coast Red Meat Cluster, we would be hoping to, to run some more. So. Um, and um, I've certainly, we've had a lot of interest in this webinar and thanks Carlin for recording it. And yes, as Carlin said, we'll be sending that out through the various networks. So um, yes, yeah, so anyone that you know couldn't log on tonight um, and uh, perhaps let them know that uh, there is a link available there to, to, to watch the webinar in their own time. Thanks Carlin. Okay, thanks everybody.